So, uh, can everybody hear me? Now I'm using the microphone. That's okay, right. Okay, so uh, that's what I intend to do. It's going to be a rather broad overview with uh, uh, not much uh, technical detail, and I hope to be provocative in the questions uh, uh, that I'm going to raise. If you have uh, any question whilst I'm speaking, please don't hesitate to, uh, to ask it. Okay, well, uh, you've heard about the organization, so I'll leave it there. And now my first point is that uh, the continued observation of astrophysical objects which uh, involve black holes continues, the most striking one recently having taken place at 9.45 universal time on September the 4th last year. Uh, this is the observation by LIGO, the LIGO team that uh, they've seen a gravitational wave uh, signal coming from the collision of two rather heavy black holes uh, which, are spiraling, which spiraled around each other uh, and uh, formed a final black hole uh, emitting about three solar masses. Um, that means actually that the luminosity in the time uh, that it took uh, is enormous. In fact, there's a natural upper bound to the luminosity of any object, uh, according to various speculations, called the Dyson bound. Uh, it's not due to Dyson, actually, but I'll come back. I don't want to dwell on that. Anyhow, if you form the object c to the fifth divided by 4g, this is the maximum luminosity of any object according to general relativity. It's a conjecture, not a proof theorem. And it follows from another conjecture, the so-called uh, maximum tension uh, conjecture, which is the largest force or tension you can have in general relativity, is c to the fourth over 4g. And if you multiply the maximum velocity by the maximum tension, you get this, uh, uh, this uh, result. So uh, this uh, emission is about 10 to the minus 3 of a Dyson, which is an incredibly high amount of energy coming up in a short time. And as far as we can tell at present, this and all these other phenomena are well described by what I'm going to call the standard theory of black hole uh, physics. You can add the word astrophysical because I'm referring to its applications in, at this point to astrophysics. And I'm going to be talking about uh, this theory and how it's being um, uh, modified and advanced and what kind of questions will have to be answered if one departs from the fundamental principles. So this uh, standard model was the result of a lot of work by a lot of people since the founding of the theory. Uh, and it incorporates what I'm going to call many fundamental physical principles. So whenever I have something in blue, it's meant to be a fundamental physical principle. And I'll enumerate those later. And the uh, validity of these has received uh, very strong support in general relativity from an enormous number of high precision experiments and an enormous range of observations. So what do I mean by fundamental principles? So there's a lot of confusion in when people use this term. Um, I mean general statements expected to be true of all viable theories and which may follow within a given theory as a consequence of its mathematical structure. In other words, a theorem that you demonstrate, right? They may be used to motivate the construction of the theory uh, and um, uh, they certainly in the past, the ones I'm going to mention, have had what you might call... Um, heuristic value in motivating a theory, but they don't constitute a precise statement of the theory. They're just things that we'd like to happen. There's a lot of confusion when people talk about these things, you know, saying it's logically impossible to have violate a certain principle, and it never is. It's simply that you'd like it to be true. And that's going to crop up in extensions of general relativity that people are talking about. An example, just to make it clear, is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, is an elementary consequence of wave mechanics and Fourier transforms, and indeed it can't define wave mechanics. Wave mechanics is largely defined by the Schrodinger equation and the interpretation of the, of the amplitude. Uh, it rests heavily on translation invariance and may or may not be true in general quantum uh, context. So that's a fundamental principle which a lot of people would go along with, but it perhaps has limited validity. Now, in general relativity, one thinks of Marx principle uh, and various equivalence principles. And uh, I finally note that um, uh, if you have enough uh, experimental and observational evidence 
for such principles, then of course they acquire a status of a law of physics. Now, I'm not going to talk about laws of physics because that's real physics and actually checking with experiment. Um, now, uh, one such principle within black hole physics is a black hole has, such, has no hair. Uh, and it may or may not hold, of course, in any given gravitational theory. That's a great point of discussion. Uh, but that's a fairly conventional one. I alluded to a principle that I and, and a guy called Schiller suggested some years ago, the maximum tension uh, uh, principle, which has not been proved. There are lots of examples special cases, uh, and I don't regard it as having the same status, but it's, it, 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 uh, uh, as the no hair uh, principle, or the other principles I'm about to enumer enumerate. So that, the fundamental framework I've just referred to is under attack at present uh, from observations of uh, galaxies and galactic clusters. That's the dark matter problem. And that could be a part of conventional physics, or it could be non-conventional physics, in which case the principles that we think as fundamental, some of them will have to go, as I will try to explain. Um, uh, the CMB and distant supernova show the existence of some cosmic repulsion force or of cosmic acceleration, uh, and... Uh, that may require an explanation, or it may not. It depends on taste. You can either say it's just the cosmological constant, which in my view is a very good explanation. It fits all the data and should be uh, regarded as a triumphal, triumphant, triumph of a new pr uh, prediction of general relativity made by Einstein and, uh, and de Sitter and coming naturally from the fundamental structure. Or you can say it challenges other principles in physics and uh, want to change the whole structure of physics because of that. Um, and of course, we all know that general relativity is a classical theory, and therefore it needs to be made consistent with quantum theory, and uh, that also requires some modification of our fundamental principles. They might be minor modifications, or they might be major um, modifications. So what I'm going to do now is make more precise what these... Uh, Fundamental principles are in the standard model, as I call it, how they're incorporated into our current black hole paradigm, and what sort of uh, modifications are being brought about by uh, work in the literature. So what is the standard model uh, I'm talking about? It's classical general relativity coupled minimally uh, to the standard model of particle physics. So the minimal coupling is fairly unambiguous, and in this talk I shall take it to exclude our phi squared terms where phi is the Higgs field. It's slightly controversial in the literature, but the minimal assumption is there are no phi, uh, phi squared terms. Now, once you've constructed that, it incorporates a number of fundamental principles. Uh, it incorporates the weak equivalence principle, the strong equivalence principle, which uh, together are usually called the universality of free fall. The word universality will be important in what I'm saying. Um, it incorporates an even more important principle, probably the central pr uh, uh, important principle of all of science, which is predictability from initial data. In other words, if you know the world at one time, you should be able to tell us what the world is at later times. And uh, general relativity incorporates that to some limited extent, as I will explain. Uh, another thing, which is, I think, a weaker principle, is Einstein causality. Einstein causality be can be characterized by the fact that there is a universal maximum speed in nature and nothing can follow faster, uh, can move faster than that. Now, it's important to realize that this is not a necessary logical thing to have in any theory. There are no contradictions in theories uh, which uh, don't have Einstein causality, and many on the market do not have Einstein causality in that sense. Um, so it's a, uh, something that you might be inclined to give up more readily than some of the others. In my view, general relativity does not uh, uh, incorporate uh, Marx's principle, uh, certainly in many of the formulations that are sufficiently precise, and right now it seems to be neither necessary nor relevant to physics, but it did play a part in the 
construction of the theory by Einstein. Okay, well, those are the words. Let's uh, firm that up with a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, first of all, uh, as everybody knows, general relativity admits a Lagrangian and a Hamiltonian structure. This may or may not be necessary. Uh, some people think it's necessary for quantization. Uh, I don't think that's a logical necessity. You could quantize without either a Hamiltonian or a, a Lagrangian, uh, if you wished. Um, but anyhow, everything is fine for general relativity. And given that, we can define notions like uh, total energy and momentum for an isolated system, P mu, uh, and then we have, as consequences, positive energy theorems, P mu is future-directed time-like. Now, you might regard as a fundamental principle that P mu should be future-directed time-like for an isolated system, and there's no trouble about that because it's a theorem in general relativity, so it satisfies that requirement. But these theorems are based on, amongst other things, the dominant energy condition. I'll say more precisely what that is later. And the well-known singularity theorems, to which I will allude later, uh, to uh, detail later, depend on the strong energy condition. So one is making additional assumptions which one may wish uh, to think as fundamental. Now, most of these consequences uh, are uh, a consequence of the fact that general relativity is a single metric theory. Universality means uh, only one metric and everybody obeys the rules of that metric. Uh, and moreover, the equations that govern it are uh, what uh, I usually call semi-linear PDEs. I'll tell you what those are later. Uh, sometimes they're called quasi-linear. And they're second order in derivatives. And the question we have to confront today is whether that sort of equations are a necessary condition for a viable theory or whether you can go beyond them. And the main point is that many, uh, much work in the literature uh, incorporates theories which violate these in very serious fashions. So the question we must ask is, uh, what do we have to do about that? First of all, do, how do we understand the physics and the mathematics of such equations, and then does it matter? So let's uh, put a little bit more precision in this. It's, I'm not going to write many equations down, um, but in detail, uh, what we believe is that all free particle motion um, is given by time-like or null geodesics satisfying equation one and uh, that uh, gamma object there is the uh, torsion-free Levi-Civita connection of the metric. Um, mathematically, this is telling you that there's a universal projective structure which all falling particles follow. So we are actually in the realm of a um, projective theory. Now, the other thing that general relativity uh, incorporates is that if you have a wave equation, the wave equation can typically be solved in the WKB approximation by making this assumption here. And uh, when you do that, that S is the phase, you find that uh, this is basically the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Uh, it's the first order expansion in, a, in 1 over h bar. Uh, you get this equation too, and that tells you that got a, um, uh, a time-like or now geodesic. Uh, and all of the equations of the standard model, which are minimally coupled, uh, are basically of this structure, g mu nu, d mu, d nu psi, is equal to lower derivative terms. These lower derivative terms don't matter when you look at the causality, and here we have, uh, we have universal causality. I'll expand upon that later. Um, it's obvious also that this incorporates the wave-particle duality in a rather nice way, because we know in quantum mechanics we can think of particles as particles or particles as waves. Actually, uh, I rather like the suggestion of uh, Levi Leblanc that they're neither particles nor waves, but what he calls quantons, uh, an entity which can only arise because they're truly quantum mechanical. But whether or not you like that form of words, uh, this is how it comes out in, um, in our standard model of general relativity. These wavefront surfaces uh, define space-like or uh, null hypersurfaces, 
and they define what are called the characteristic surfaces of the wave equation for phi, and hence its causal cone. And uh, these causal cones are the same for all particles, and hence we have a universal causal structure that's absolutely intrinsic to general relativity. It's common, of course, it's actually not defining the metric completely, strictly speaking, uh, if you have a metric G and a metric omega squared G, they have the same cones, the same causality, so it defines a universal conformal structure. And there are various um, formulations in the literature of um, formulating a, uh, uh, a theorem which says that the intersection of these two structures gives us precisely a Lorentzian metric uh, of the sort that we use and a torsion free. Um, in fact, uh, this sort of situation can also work if we have particles in uh, extra uh, fields like electromagnetic fields. I just want to mention something here uh, that uh, illustrates the point. In condensed matter physics, you're often dealing with electrons and only electrons. Their charge to mass ratio is the same. And so they actually satisfy a form of the equivalence principle. It cancels out in the equations. And uh, this is actually a theorem in um, condensed matter physics which goes by the name of Cohn's theorem. So uh, we capture here a partial, in electrodynamics, a partial universality of free fall uh, only if we can consider uh, particles of a certain type. In general relativity, it doesn't matter what particle we choose they all fall in the same way. And um, the argument I gave that this was true because of uh, the, uh, wave part, the WKB approximation goes much deeper. Um, it extends to gravitating bodies uh, and uh, uh, as long as you ignore the size of the body in some sense and can be derived for fully gravitating bodies, that was a program initiated by uh, Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman in the 30s, and, uh, and so that gives you the strong equivalence principle, as it's called in the literature, that the weak equivalence principle is true even for gravitating uh, bodies. And uh, actually, for ordinary matter, it follows almost trivially from the conservation equations, T alpha beta, semicolon beta is equal to zero. If you uh, ask that the support of T alpha beta be close to a world line, then it follows as a theorem that the world line will be uh, a time-like world line and a geodesic of some average background metric. Well, this is all pretty familiar stuff. Um, let's come on to the subject of my talk. The standard definition informally, everybody in the street knows this if you ask uh, you know, your gardener, he'll say, a black hole, I know all about that. It's something from which nothing can escape. It's, in other words, a universal object. Of course, the, f the precise definition might be an absolute event horizon. I won't give the full shenanigans about how you define that. Or it might be a killing horizon. Uh, but they depend, uh, crucially, on this universality because you compute them using the unique metric. But it goes even deeper than that. The weak energy condition, the null energy condition, the dominant energy condition, and the strong energy condition, which I've enumerated here, all depend on either the conformal class of the metric or the metric itself. So for example, uh, if we take the weak energy condition, it just says that if you uh, look at T00 in any frame, it should be non-negative. Uh, and what that means is if you saturate it with a time-like vector, uh, then you should be uh, non-negative. And uh, to define a time-like vector, you use the metric or any multiple of it. Uh, then there's uh, the null energy condition, which is used in most derivations of results in black hole physics. Uh, if, for example, the area increase, uh, as another assumption also used. Uh, and uh, now this is the dominant energy which may be less familiar to people, um, it uh, basically can be formulated in various ways. When you read about it in the books, it says that T00, the energy dis de uh, density, exceeds in, a, uh, in absolute magnitude every other component in the stress tensor. 
uh, it, for example, says energy density is bigger or at most equal to uh, the pressure, which can be formulated for a gas as saying that the speed of sound in that gas can be no larger than um, light. So it's an attempt to incorporate Einstein uh, causality. Um, and that's vital for various proofs of the positive energy theorems that go into proving uh, results about P mu that I mentioned. Finally, and the one that's uh, less uh, uh, familiar in it, but nevertheless essential uh, is the strong energy condition, which is that if you saturate the Ricci tensor with time like vectors, it's greater or equal to zero. Now, the informal uh, formulation of that in ordinary words, um, okay, well, I'll just say this uh, just to remind you uh, or tell you if you're not familiar with this. Uh, it's a nice theorem of Hawking. He introduced the dominant energy condition, uh, and he showed that it prevents matter appearing and disappearing in an a-causal fashion. Only very weakly only very weakly. For example, dominant energy uh, implies um, strong energy, uh, not strong energy, uh, weak energy. Uh, there's also, you can be a bit pernickety uh, whether you uh, apply these inequalities to uh, the open set of time-like vectors or extend them to the closed set of uh, time-like and null vectors, i.e. causal vectors. So there's room for wiggling there, which pure mathematicians like to take advantage of. Um, now, um, the connection between R mu the strong energy condition is, uh, is, of course, by the Einstein equations. That's how we use it. And then we, we can translate it into the corresponding statement uh, in terms of uh, T mu nu. And I think there's partial overlap. Um, I'm going to make some comments about this uh, later, which may clarify that point. Uh, one thing is that you have to remember that um, T mu nu uh, when you, it cannot always be diagonalized. You have to put it in general in your damn form. So if it's diagonalizable, it's pretty easy to figure out what inequalities are imposed on the energy densities and the pressures. Uh, but if it's not diagonalizable, then it's a slightly more complicated um, uh, fact. One uh, uh, consequence of these, uh, they're, they're all convex. So if I have two T mu nu's and add them with positive coefficients, the result will satisfy these requirements. That's actually very useful uh, because you only have to check individual terms. And if you have a very complicated Lagrangian, uh, you, you don't want to be going through the whole thing. And I mean, it's possible that that convexity has something to do with a deeper notion of convexity for uh, physical systems. But um, so I've given you, I think, as much as I can at present. But let's return to it um, later. OK, so the strong energy condition uh, may be paraphrased as saying gravity is attractive. Technically, that's done via the rechard hiri equation or something of that sort. It's a key assumption in the singularity theorems and in Hawking's area increase theorem uh, for black hole event horizons. And in fact, uh, that gives rise by a chain of arguments to uh, uh, showing it's consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is a cherished fundamental principle. Uh, it may or may not be a law of nature for continuum systems. I'm not talking about its statistical formulation. Um, but you certainly, uh, it's a sufficient condition that the strong energy condition holds. Uh, and its status in more general theories is unclear. And um, then you are going to be in the situation, if you entertain such theories, as um, uh, threatening the most cherished uh, uh, assumptions and beliefs of uh, your neighbor who will say you're crazy or so. But um, OK, so um, now by a related piece of theory in this beautiful paper, uh, you actually get some boundary conditions uh, on event horizons from these conditions. They're all in this. Uh, brilliant paper by Stephen, uh, which really um, was part of this magic year in 1972 when the, uh, or so, when uh, the foundations of our subject were uh, formulated. And at the same time, 
the classical laws of black hole mechanics were also formulated in that year uh, and at that very meeting, the Les Uches Lecture meeting. Incidentally, uh, the Les Uches, uh, lectures are in a book, but uh, the most important ones are available on general relativity and gravitation as gold and oldies, significant old papers. So if you want to look up these, uh, these uh, um, lectures from Les Uches, it's easy enough to get them online. Now I want to come back to the issue of predictability. And this is absolutely central to all science. So it was first shown by, I believe, uh, Yvonne Shockey Bruhan. She's got a beautiful review here written for non-experts. It's uh, basically trying to describe her life's work. Um, that uh, the predictability principle is incorporated in general relativity in a form, incomplete. So the idea is that uh, you have to fix a gauge in order to solve the Einstein equations. Uh, there are four diffeomorphisms that you can make, uh, or four a diffeomorphism uh, which uh, can change, uh, uh, which is worth uh, four functions. And that means that unless you fix a gauge, there's no way of predicting the future in, in, a, in a way whatsoever. Um, so you fix the gauge, and the one she chose was um, uh, harmonic coordinates, as they used to be called, or what she prefers to call wave coordinates. The we reason that she wants to call them wave coordinates is very sensible. Uh, they tell you that the coordinates you're using solve the wave equation. So they're massless scalar fields, if you like. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yes, yeah, the trace of that, sorry. Uh, when you've done that, um, the equations reduce to this magic form that the, um, what you might call the raw Laplacian, just g mu nu, d mu, d nu, acting on g alpha beta is, uh, a, oh dear, the indices of actually alpha beta, I'm sorry, uh, are just functions of lower derivative. So these are uh, semi linear or quasi linear. And what that means is that if you introduce uh, uh, one of your, uh, if you use one of your harmonic coordinates and call it time, uh, say t equals constant, uh, then uh, if it's space-like with respect to the metric, g upper t t will not be zero, and that means you can solve for all second time derivatives in terms of first time derivatives uh, and, and no time derivatives. And you can, define, you can do that uniquely. So you only have to give the data g alpha beta and g dot alpha beta to determine uh, uniquely all the higher time derivatives. And then you construct a series which you hope will converge to give the solution in a little neighborhood of the initial surface. So that's what she did. Um, and you also have to check that the gauge condition is propagated by the equations. So this is a magnificent achievement uh, of many people, uh, starting with people like Nignerovitz and others, and shows us that at least uh, some element of predictability is satisfied by Einstein's theory. So it, over, it, sat, it um, uh, jumps over the hurdle of uh, predictability, but not completely. So you obtain an unambiguous prediction of the future at least for sufficiently small times. Um, but the singularity theorems show that this need not hold for all time. So that um, bookmark down here is the space. This is a famous summary of the Hawking Penrose singularity theorems, which show that there's a large class of data which will form singularities. And so general relativity is not predictable. That means it's not a satisfactory or viable theory at the absolute level and requires modification. Now, that modification may be a classical modification or it might be a quantum modification. The consensus view, I think, of a large number of people is, well, we have another problem, which is quantizing gravity, so we should be able to get rid of it by uh, introducing a new theory for which even the conceptual structure may be radically different. Okay. Now, actually, there is good news as well. Uh, Chris Dudulu and Kleinemann have shown 
uh, that a, a predictability does hold for sufficiently weak data. So you have to have sufficiently concentrated data which has got the possibility of forming a black hole or something like it or some non-trivial topology in order to get a singularity. Okay, so it's an imperfect but pretty good theory. Um, let me just say a word about uh, this in terms of topologically uh, non-trivial initial data. Uh, we have to solve uh, the, uh, if you look at what is the free data, uh, it's actually not all of G alpha beta and whatever, but it uh, it's, uh, has to satisfy constraints, uh, which uh, are Hamiltonian constraints. And the reason for that is that when you write out the Hamiltonian, it's got uh, two qua uh, four quantities which contain no derivatives. So those four quantities, when you vary, give you constraints. They just uh, don't have equations of motion of their own. And solving those uh, constraints is vital for carrying out this program of um, evolving the data. And of course, nowadays, that's done uh, with great skill by uh, uh, people who simulate uh, computer calculations. And in particular, I spoke earlier of the collision of the two black holes. That was uh, calculated, of course, by taking initial data satisfying the constraints. Now, it's easy to, con to construct initial data which is exotic, which has got wormholes or Einstein-Rosen bridges in. So a, a, an Einstein-Rosen bridge is basically two sheets connected by a throat. And if you then take the throat, cut it, and glue it back on, you get a wormhole, by analogy with the things that worms do. And these were first constructed very explicitly by Misner and, uh, and Wheeler. Um, and uh, what the sing singularity theorems tell you, and it's consistent with the equations of motion, is that they will have singularities in the future. Um, in fact, you can also do this for, uh, just I'm now indulging in a piece of uh, advertising, you can do this for supergravity theories and a whole variety of other theories. And what I will say shortly is supergravity theories satisfy all the good properties, that is to say, ungaged supergravity theories. Um, so, uh, sadly, we don't have these exotic objects uh, without violating fundamental principles. And um, that hasn't deterred people looking for them in astrophysics, and I will come on to that later. Okay, so basically, the simplest and most beautiful extension uh, of uh, our standard model would be a supersymmetric standard model coupled to gravity. And if that could come out of a supergravity model, uh, that would be marvelous because all the good things are in the supergravity model themselves. And you can check uh, for every model that's presented to you that it satisfies all of the requirements uh, that I've mentioned. As long as it's ungaged. And uh, if you want to add a cosmological term, then there are modifications which are true independently of whether it came from a, a supergravity or uh, other theory. So it uh, if you have a positive cosmological constant, it changes some things. The most important thing it changes is the strong energy condition because gravity is not always attractive if you have a cosmological term which is positive. That's what's called the um, acceleration of the universe and it's the most plausible explanation for what the astronomers are seeing. Um, so that's not fundamental in any real sense. It can be violated and is probably violated in the real world, or almost certainly. Um, but that introduces actually uh, an interesting class of objects, which is you, you can have objects which have a black hole horizon and because of the repulsive motion, uh, a cosmological horizon. The particles are either sucked inwards or outwards, put, repelled outwards. And this I uh, have called in popular lectures an inside-out black hole. Um, the interesting thing about this, uh, and I'm going to come on to this later, is that the two horizons both have surface gravities, and in particular, in the, uh, in, when you look at quantum field theory, they have two different Hawking temperatures. So it's not an equilibrium situation. It's rather generic, in fact, with a positive cosmological constant. And I'm going to come on to that theme uh, shortly. 
Uh, in the case of negative cosmological constants, uh, which arise in gauge supergravity theories, uh, the weak and dominant energy conditions no longer hold, but um, the modified form uh, given by initially Brighton, Lohner, and Friedman is sufficient to prove positive mass theorems and things. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, that was done by members of the audience uh, some years ago, uh, or a member. Um, there's no analog of cosmological horizons because that, that theory is attractive. And, um, and so there's no question of things being shot off to infinity. There's also an issue of predictability, which is not uh, really, uh, most people are not aware of this because they don't think in terms of PDE theory. Uh, ADS, which is very popular, has a, com has a time like boundary. And so you must give some conditions on the time-like boundary. Uh, when you've given them, it looks as if it's all right, but it also looks, from work of uh, Bison and others, that the generic situation is singular. It's you have no analog of the Christodoulou uh, Kleinman result. And that's taken in, conformal in uh, the ADS uh, CFT community to be just what you'd expect because the thing is confined in a box and it's trying to thermalize itself. I mean, the field theory on the boundary is trying to thermalize itself. Therefore, it must form black holes. Therefore, it must become singular. Um, but uh, there are issues about uh, these principles in the uh, standard um, ADS-CFT correspondence. Now, I want to turn to... Um, uh, more recent theories, and they appear to be based on another deeply cherished belief, which I call the no higher derivatives than two principle. And uh, this has been used as a selection principle for an enormous number of uh, theories which have developed very striking theories with a very interesting structure. Now, in classical theories, excitations whose kinetic energies are negative are often called ghosts or phantoms. Now, I don't like the words ghost or phantoms, not because they conjure up some uh, lousy uh, Hollywood movie, but rather um, they're used in two different ways, which is a much more serious uh, problem than having to sit through a Hollywood movie. Um, the term ghost can either mean negative kinetic energy or uh, it can mean negative norm in Hilbert space. The two are related, as I shall explain, but I'm going to use the uh, words poltergeist to be a classical excitation which carries negative kinetic energy. Now, of course, you can have ghostly uh, poltergeists and various other types of poltergeists, but these are ubiquitous in many theories, even though tr people try to eliminate them in various ways. So I, I'm... Uh, going to uh, discuss this. All of the basic theory of this seems to go back to a beautiful paper of Pice and Uhlenbeck in the 50s who treated, uh, um, uh, who treated linear fields but with higher derivatives. And um, this theory also treated infinitely many fields. Uh, the title of the field paper is illustrated here on field theories with non-localized action. Now, I'm not going to go in that direction, and I know of nobody who wants to, but that's even beyond the pale, as it were. So for what I'm going to say, it'll be uh, a localized action with a finite number of derivatives. But the theory is really exciting if you get into that. Issues of causality and so forth are, uh, well, they were in, in the 1950s, and I think they still are, uh, were kind of uh, um, frontier. Uh, they were at the very limits of people's understanding of the relevant mathematics. In the linear case, that was easy. In the nonlinear case, it's, it's really complicated. So let's stick with local theories, by which I mean that there is a finite number of uh, derivatives. Now, there's a result uh, due to Ostrogradsky. Oh, I forgot to bring his paper, but it doesn't matter. Uh, which is uh, no, uh, not stated explicitly in the paper. He wrote a paper of about 50 or 60 pages in 1850, and actually uh, it's, I think, been misquoted a great deal. Um, it's said that uh, if it has derivatives higher than two, it can or will uh, violate the no pol poltergeist uh, principle. Um, 
I'll come to why, uh, what that means in detail shortly. Uh, in general, uh, poltergeists can be quantized and uh, they don't have to be ghosts. Uh, the uh, norm of a poltergeist state can be made positive, uh, uh, but you have the negative energy states remaining. It's not a generic statement. For certain higher derivative theories, you can't get rid of negative norm states, uh, and uh, these are presumably ghostly poltergeists. Um, now, um, uh, there is an alternative on the market, which is to say, let's have negative norms, uh, and then we can have positive energy. That's the way the mathematics goes. Well, I think that's just a façon de parler, as they say in French. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of fig leaf to cover the fact that, uh, you know, it's clear that if you have a positive debt with negative probability, uh, you're doing badly, or the other way around, I should say. Um, uh, the two are equivalent. Um, uh, for the time being, I am. I, for the time being, I am, because that's the simplest. I will get down and describe what a horrendous mess it is uh, if you don't do that later. This pa uh, Technically, that's what people state. Uh, and in fact, I was going to tell you exactly what he said, um, um, because it wasn't, in fact, about a field derivative. So let's see what Mr. Um, um, uh, Ostrogradsky actually said. So this is the gentleman, and I claim that like uh, those of Mark Twain's death, reports of Ostrogradsky's results and their implications have been greatly exaggerated. So what he did is he gave a general prescription for casting a Lagrangian uh, with a finite number of degrees of freedom. Uh, he wasn't thinking it was a Lagrangian for mechanics, just a general variational principle involving higher derivatives into Hamiltonian form. Provided, and this is an important proviso, a certain non-degeneracy condition holds, which I won't write out, but that's in, you need it. He stated, as far as I can tell, nothing about the sign of the Hamiltonian, and he say, stated nothing about the stability of the system of equations. What actually comes out from his work is that the Hamiltonian contains at least one term, linear in momentum, and hence, after the effect, people commented, is unbounded above or below. And that's true for the time derivatives of any theory. So if you just forgot the space derivatives and look at the bit of the Hamiltonian, that's pure time, uh, that's what emerges. He was completely silent on the issues of uh, stability, and this actually remains controversial to this day. Um, what people uh, studied uh, in the paper I alluded to and still study are linear systems, all of whose frequencies are real and distinct. And in that case, it's trivial that it's stable. And, of course, if the frequencies coincided, you'd have a, a growing mode of the usual type. Adding uh, interactions gives a difficult uh, problem in dynamical systems. Uh, the outcome, not here outcome, sorry, depends on details. So you can find examples where you get blow up in finite time, and you can find examples, I believe, in, uh, these are for s simple PDEs, uh, which uh, don't. Um, and um, my understanding of literature is that there are no general statements that you can make if you ask dynamical systems theory people about even one of ODEs, they can't really give you much of an answer. Should be borne in mind that even if the Hamiltonian is not bounded below, there's no reason why there shouldn't be other functions which are constants of the motion or who, which you have control over. So um, uh, I think it's a bit obscure. But that's going to be one of the big questions that has to be answered uh, in certain types of gravity theories. So for example, um, if you just look at the lowest order renormalization of Einstein's theory, it contains these derivatives. And they're usually thought not to be viable in that sense. You don't rely on those terms. But if you had a theory where those were important terms, uh, then you have to face up to what is called uh, uh, Ostrogradsky's instability and a lot of other things. Uh, I think there could be a better term and uh, really, we should be using the word poltergeist. I mean, uh, this guy, let's see if I can do it. No, um, I want to go. 
is certainly no poltergeist. Okay, so that's what he actually did. And uh, actually what that means is that there can be, at least in the uh, terminology of Smilgar, I haven't given the reference, uh, benevolent poltergeists and malevolent poltergeists. Um, in, I said here, in classical field theory, it seems even more difficult. Um, and in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, there seems to be a debate in the literature. I guess most people would say that they are a disaster. That would be the conventional view, uh, because uh, you can obviously extract negative energy and, and uh, the thing could blow up, and the amplitudes for that should be non-zero. But there are still people who uh, advocate... Uh, these, these uh, constructions because they were introduced to regulate field theories, quantum field theories, uh, precisely at the time of uh, the Peiss-Uhlenbeck uh, model. And today there are still advocates of a Lee-Wick regularization for the standard model, which has certain advantages in um, naturalness and so forth. And if you, turn, if you look on, uh, on uh, the uh, um, HEP website, you'll see oodles of papers from people who are actually looking for the effects of these ghosts at LHC. So it's an observable question, is the point, and thus within the realm of physics, is my opinion. Poltergeist actually entered cosmology a long time ago with what was called the steady state theory and Nalika and Hoyle's formulation in terms of a so-called C field. The C field has negative kinetic energy and uh, thus makes possible continuous creation of matter um, and evades uh, Hawking's theorem, for example, in that way. Um, although Hawking's theorem postdates the steady state theory. Uh, more recently, it's been invoked to account for cosmic acceleration. The place where I first saw it is in this one, but I'm not claiming that's the only uh, paper. It's just a sample paper. Uh, but uh, the... Um, Ghosts or phantoms, as they're often called, are prevalent in the cosmological literature, and there are a lot of issues to be asked about that. For example, even in the past, no one asked of the steady state, well, what would happen to orbits? But it's clear orbits ought to be unstable, and that would be an observable astronomical fact. But no one at the time even thought to do it, and uh, the effect may be very small over very long time scales, um, but uh, it's uh, it's... It should be easy to rule out lots of these massless poltergeists. Uh, they can be uh, minimally coupled to a metric, and like tachyons, they propagate causally. They satisfy Einstein causality. Uh, by tachyon, I mean a particle whose m squared is negative. Um, and indeed, they also satisfy in their simplest form a, um, a no-hair theorem, as do... Uh, um, uh, well, poltergeist because if you took the Klein-Gordon equation and then uh, changed the sign, um, but you had m squared negative, uh, then you would get a, uh, an O'Hare theorem. And if you, m squared is zero, massless poltergeist, then the standard O'Hare theorems work and standard causal causality works. Okay. Now, actually, there are some uh, rather interesting solutions, and there's been, uh, I, M uh, Michael, I think, will be discussing some of these, but there are interesting solutions which allow non-singular wormhole solutions. So there's a whole exotic zoo if you couple poltergeists to ordinary gravity. And in particular, there are solutions with these nice non-singular um, Einstein-Rosen bridge uh, constructions. I'll show you the details uh, shortly. Uh, much of the literature calls these wormholes, but I prefer to restrict the word wormhole to non-simply connected solutions, whereas uh, the Einstein-Rosen bridge uh, configuration, which is at the heart of in the middle of every black hole solution we know, which is non-extreme, is not uh, multiply connected. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, there are quite a few theorems of a whole variety uh, which tell you that in four-dimensional gravity, uh, these kind of uh, exotic topologies just don't occur. Um, and uh, they can't occur for two separate reasons. There's not enough flexibility in the topology, and at the same time, uh, you have uh, good energy conditions. 
In fact, if you go up in higher dimensions, as uh, Nick Warner has shown many times, there's a whole exotic family of fuzzballs which you can construct, but their construction depends essentially on the fact that the richness of uh, four-dimensional manifolds is much larger than of three-dimensional manifolds. So uh, already, uh, in principle, uh, issues to do with non-simply connected space-times, CTCs and causality violation would arise even in su uh, supergravity theories. But I leave that as a comment. This uh, famous wormhole solution uh, was constructed independently by two people, um, Veronikov, I'm not sure what his first name is, and a guy who calls himself Homer Ellis in the early 70s. And the metric is absolutely simple. It's ultra-static. Uh, you can let R run from minus infinity to plus infinity. So there are two flat ends. Uh, 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 R equals plus infinity and minus infinity. And actually, uh, mathematically, you can have great fun constructing other solutions because you can use standard uh, solution generating solution uh, techniques to get things, for example, which don't have GTT equal to a constant, which are not ultra static. Um, the um, there's quite an activity going on. Again, Michael, I hope, will comment on this about fi the finding non-singular wormholes in more exotic uh, theories. Uh, no, it's, it's gravity plus a massless scalar field with negative kinetic energy. In other words, it's a poltergeist which is coupled to gravity. So if you want to know what a poltergeist looks like, this is the image of a poltergeist. It's a special, it's a special extreme solution. Um, yeah, poltergeists can anti-gravitate. Uh, recently, in fact, multi-static uh, solutions, multi-bridge solutions have been constructed. Uh, I've forgotten the reference. I haven't written it down. Um, but also, you can write down the following uh, very trivial solution, uh, which is uh, this one. Uh, it, um, it involves a harmonic function, H, and uh, you just have to make sure it's harmonic and you've got a solution. And if you have a multi-center harmonic function, you've got a bunch of poltergeists, albeit singular, which are in uh, static equilibrium. So it resembles the BPS solutions of supergravity theories, but it has a singularity. And uh, I guess uh, it could well be, I haven't checked this, it could well be a BPS solution of fake supergravity, because you can clearly construct fake supergravity with uh, phantoms, and indeed people do. Uh, so that's some of the botany of these. Um, okay, so perhaps you don't like higher derivatives, uh, then you're in real trouble, I claim. So uh, you, uh, you're scared of poltergeists, uh, you adopt the uh, no higher derivatives than two principle, and life gets really terrible. In four dimensions for pure gravity, it's not a big deal because the Lovelock theorems, which are for pure gravity in all dimensions, as a series of, Lagrange, of, of uh, field equations derivable from a Lagrangian constructed by Lovelock, which have no higher than second derivatives, those be, uh, uh, become trivial in four space-time dimensions unless you couple uh, the curvature terms that you need, curvature squared terms, uh, topological terms, to um, some axions or pseudoscalars and other things. Then, actually, they begin to live and they share many of the difficulties that I'm going to describe. Now, uh, many years ago, uh, Lovelock and his student Hondesky uh, considered what would happen if you had a scalar and a metric. So this looks like a universal theory. It looks as if you're using the principle that there's only one metric. And what I want to argue is that this is false. Uh, as Pauli would have said, it's Gans false. Um, now, the point here is, um, that um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it fails uh, the Einstein uh, causality principle, but also predictability. And to see why, I am going to try and answer the question that Gabrielli asked earlier. Um, the basic field equations look like uh, the following. Since he's only got second derivatives as highest, you can solve horrid nonlinear equations to produce uh, a uh, field equation, which is uh, some matrix multiplying uh, the fields. Now, the fields are two in number, the metric and the scalar. And so this is a matrix with those indices, and it is also indexing the mu-mu terms. 
And uh, this is uh, not, in general, uh, uh, semi-linear or anything. Well, it looks as if it might work, but it's, it's really awful. Um, because uh, you've got to um, invert. First of all, to get this equation, you have to solve a nonlinear equation in second derivatives. That may have a solution. It may have many solutions. And the solutions, as you move about, may merge and disappear and jump around. So it's very difficult to say that this is predictable. Which branch do you choose? And then if it goes wrong, you're stuck. So I don't think these are at all predictable. Uh, the best you can hope is that when you write these equations out, uh, GTT uh, occurs linearly, and so you can solve for it. So that's a subset. So you can imagine that GTT arises in your set of equations linearly. Sorry, the t, uh, g dot dot. Uh, g, uh, sorry, I meant to say uh, uh, a time derivative. But the other derivatives are, are a mess. Uh, so then, in principle, uh, you can solve. Uh, but the problem is that the corresponding characteristics will be extremely complicated. Um, as I say here, you could pick a branch uh, and seek to find phi double dot as functions of phi a, and uh, you get some characteristic surfaces, and basically you'll have some kind of kernel uh, uh, here, and you uh, look at the kernel, and that defines directions, you linear, so, so the algebra becomes very complicated, and there are very few complete treatments of this for even the simplest higher derivative theories. Um, if you linearize, which is the easy thing, then the equations become simpler because uh, what you find is that you do get uh, a, a kind of light cone structure for the linearized fluctuations. So this is an easy, well, easy, it's a straightforward calculation. But you do not get an ordinary cone. You get many cones or many branches of cones. You get all the rich physics you get with uh, optical propagation in a birefringent medium. And uh, it's very difficult to say uh, which, uh, which system. Some modes will travel on one cone. Some modes will travel on another cone. So now you uh, see that Einstein causality doesn't really hold. Uh, and moreover, because there's no reason for the fastest cone to be privileged. And indeed, as you move around, the two cones may swap places. So uh, it's really very, uh, very difficult. And this means that the very notion of a black hole doesn't really make a lot of uh, sense. Because you have to tell me what cone you're talking about. And the words every nothing have to be deleted. And some things can and some things can't, replacing it. So it, 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 this really attacks the very foundations of the notion of a black hole. It's almost lethal. And I see I'm coming close to the end of my time. I've made my basic uh, point. Um, and we don't know what standard model uh, does, for example. The response in the literature is to take G, uh, the, the metric G in these Horn-Desky theories and say, OK, well, standard matter couples to that. But it, it's not going to solve the problem because you're, un, you're not answering about uh, the question about what about the propagation of gravitons and phions, if I may call them that. Um, now, there's been a study of some of the solutions which are quite extensive. And there's a nice paper by Defray and Jacobson who've shown in some circumstances that um, if you have a situation where the two horizons or two killing horizons coincide, which is easiest for a bimetric theory, which is a very simple form of this, but you just have two metrics and no scalar. Um, and, uh, and, and there they find or claim that the Hawking temperatures will coincide. So you don't have an ambiguity about thermodynamics. However, uh, the following counterexample seems to show what can happen if you go beyond their assumptions. Their assumptions were di simultaneously diagonalizable of the two metrics. Um, but they didn't have any cross terms. If you put cross terms in, you can consider this metric. So this is the last statement I'm going to be making. Um, you can, uh, this uh, should be a lowercase b. I'm afraid I worked rather late last night. Uh, now, uh, it's basically the Kruskal form of a metric uh, with uh, one function of uv and another function. As such, 
they're obviously invariant under boosts. So this is a pair of solutions who share a bifurcate killing horizon. And, uh, and uh, so now the name of the game is to construct a tensor, which is this tensor here, which is independent of diffios of the G and the G twiddle, because you take another copy of the same thing. And a criterion which has been used in the literature is to say that this J tensor, which is, uh, despite its index structure, independent of, uh, well, you now form an invariant of J, from J, and, uh, it, and, and the invariants are put into the Lagrangian for this bimetric theory. Um, but uh, you want J, or J squared, or trace of J squared, or these things to be regular. But it's not difficult to construct examples. And, uh, and these examples don't have the same surface gravity. Take, for example, two Kruskal metrics, smart shell metrics with different masses, and just plonk them down. And then uh, G and R, in the two cases, will be regular, well-known solutions. And so uh, you have to face up to the fact that even in bimetric theories, which are the simplest ones which admit some notion of causality, when the cones are just a product, uh, that the temperatures are the same. You can actually construct an artificial example, which is even more exotic. These two metrics have the same killing vector. But if you displace one from the other in the UV plane, each has its own killing vector, but the killing vectors don't commute. And so you, it's almost as if you had non-commutative geometry. And, uh, well, here's the calculation, but I won't go over it in, in detail. It seems that there are some simple bi-gravity models that, exist, that exhibit solutions not like this, but of the simpler case that I mentioned. Because for some simple supergravity theories, the solutions can be two Einstein spaces. Now, I'm not a big expert on that. I just started looking at it. It looks great fun. Um, but whether it leads to good phy physics, I'm not sure. Let me finish by one remark, uh, which is that uh, um, there is certainly in the offing uh, the possibility of the demise of another cherished belief, the no hair theorem. Um, we had wanted Malcolm Perry to come and deliver a talk on this, but Malcolm has to earn his living, and part of his living is, under, is examining undergraduates. So at this very moment, the poor man is marking scripts, I think. Uh, I just wanted to mention again as a bit of advertising of what we've been doing here in, uh, in Tour. The uh, ideas involved with these soft uh, photon theorems and soft graviton theorems are intimately linked with the BMS group and the emergence of uh, what uh, we call, um, oops, with a spelling mistake, Corollian uh, symmetries. And uh, uh, we wrote a number of papers about this uh, before the work of and Perry. Many people have written such papers. And uh, in fact, what we find is that for every null surface, there is an analog of the BMS group. And we gave it a mathematical name and a structure. So the BMS symmetry is going to be ubiquitous in any theory with null hypersurfaces. And uh, uh, in fact, it's then quite obvious that the proliferation of hair uh, claimed by um, Perry, Strominger, and, and Hawking will proliferate even more, particularly in these theories with uh, many, many light points. Well, that's really what I wanted to say. The basic point I've tried to make is that the theory of black holes is entering, I believe, a radical new era, which will make, in fact, increasingly more difficult demands on theorists and oblige them to enter what is even, to pure mathematicians, virgin territory, uh, some of which I hope we will get further glimpses in the present workshop. And I just want to conclude by showing you an extract from a poem of one of my favorite poets, John Donne. Um, and here it is. Uh, and what he says to begin with is, a new philosophy calls all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost. The earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look to. So um, all uh, coherence lost is the phrase that introduces the line of this seems to me to be at the beginning of an interesting era. Let's hope it's not the end of that era. Thank you.